Helen, and welcome to Entrepreneur Cast. It's such a great pleasure to have you with us today. Hi, Svetlana. How are you? <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, it's, it's really good to have you on the show. So, Helen, before we get started with the business side of things, tell yeah. us a little bit about who are you outside of your business and what do you enjoy doing in your spare time? Um, I think, you know, things have changed since I got married and I had children. Um, I would have told you things that were very different then. Now, right now, my biggest focus with my family has become, you know, the most important thing. I think probably the people that I like hanging out with the most are my family. Uh, we laugh a lot, nonstop. And for me, laughing is really, really important. So, um, you know, my son is 15, my daughter is, is 11, and we giggle a lot. And yeah, I'm married as well. My husband is very funny. <laughs> So I would say that what I do a lot of my spare time when I have time is I usually hang out with them in some form or fashion. Um, I am trying to use my Fitbit. So any spare time I have to kind of maybe go walking or, you know, have a destination to go to so I can get some extra steps in for the day. Um, those are where my two focuses are at the moment. Of course, I have loads of other interests, et cetera. But it was, I was really thinking about it the other day. And thinking, oh, my God, your, your life's become a little narrow. But actually, I'm not upset about that at all. I'm really happy because both things make me happy so that's really okay so I, that's what i do in my spare time at the moment i don't really have any <laughs> it's family and my passion for my work i mean that's pretty much it so tell us about your business what is it that you do and what inspired you to start it uh, well, first of all, what I do at the moment and what I'm well known for in the UK, I'm known as the UK's number one scientific hand and fingerprint analyst. However, that's just the tool that I use because what I really do is I, um, I think in the words of one of my clients, but a lot of them agree, is I powerfully kickstart uh, your life purpose work. So, you know, I'm kind of a bit like a catalyst for people actually finding their life purpose and, and, the, and the work that they're here to do and actually kind of putting that all into action and turning that into a business or using their business that they've got already and making adapt, um, adapting it so that it actually is a full expression of their life purpose. Because my, my real big passion is life purpose. I'm kind of, you know, uh, I could talk about it for a week. <laughs> uh, so I have to stop myself half the time and go, yeah, yeah, people are not quite as, as thrilled as you are, girl. Just kind of, you know, hold it back a bit. <laughs> But I'm really, really passionate about it because I really believe that I'm here to actually help people uh, fulfill what I call their heavenly commitments, which sounds a little bit woo-woo, and I haven't been openly admitting that for a long time, although I've known it for most of my life. But I, I want to be open and upfront much more about it these days. That there's a very strong spiritual element to the work that I do, and that it's about bringing you know, the spiritual aspect of who we are and who we have to be and what we have to learn and how, what we have to share, but into the real world in a, in a pragmatic, sensible way. I mean, I grew up... In, on a farm in the bush in Africa. So I'm very pragmatic in many ways, but I also have a very you know, sort of spiritual aspect to, um, uh, to me. And, and I really believe it's about bringing the two together. Some people just live in the airy fairy universe of everything spiritual and wonderful and marvelous, but they never seem to be present on this earth. And it's about how do we bring these two things together? How do we live in the real world? And at the same time, have a spiritual aspect to how we're showing up in the world and, and, and spiritual purpose to what we're doing as well. Um, and what I do using the fingerprints is actually get really clear on who you are as a human being, who you're designed to be as a human being. Um, and, and that is in, in the context of, a, of a, the 3D, you know, physical world that we live in. And what does that mean in terms of your spiritual purpose as well as your, your, your what people refer to as their everyday life purpose? And I got into it because I've been running my own businesses since 1999. You know, I was an accidental, not 1999, sorry, 1996. We were just talking about me getting married, didn't we? <laughs> I got married in 1999. So, um, and, and I never intended to be in business on my own. It was all going to be corporate, you know, and I, I ran some very successful businesses for myself, but it was about 2010 or so, some stuff went on in my life where I kind of started of questions, go, hang on a second, is this the rest of my life? Is this what I'm going to contribute to the world? You know, this is not, I'm not very... I'm making really good money, um, which is great, uh, et cetera, but I don't feel I'm going to leave a positive mark on this world in any way. It's almost like I've just been here temporarily and then I'll have gone. And I'd always had this calling to find my purpose. And, you know, I started to really search um, in 2010, about, okay, what is my purpose? And, and I discovered the scientific hand and fingerprint analysis. And I just, anyway, if I can talk about life purpose for a week, I can talk about that for a month. 
because I think it's one of the most powerful things I've ever encountered and nobody was doing it in the UK. And I thought, oh my God, this is such an opportunity. It's such an incredible thing. I'm going to bring it to the UK and introduce it to people here because I think that it can change their lives. So I don't know if I did I answer all your questions there. <laughs> and that's quite an uncommon business. Oh, completely and unique. Can you imagine having come from traditional business and my husband's, you know, ex-finance world, etc., to go to a dinner party and for him to have to say, oh yeah, my wife actually looks at people's hands for a living. I mean, you know, they like, what, what planet are you on? So <laughs> to come from this very sensible, you know, my family of, you know, accountants and, and traditional business, uh, business um owners etc so for them they're like what you know what is she doing is she completely nuts but then i've always been a bit of a pioneer everything i've done has always been starting something that other people aren't doing so it's actually quite natural for me to do something to be a bit out there yes it has its challenging moments but i think the biggest part of the challenges are my own beliefs around it as opposed to other people's and i think that that's actually quite good for us to to kind of do something that we're a little uncomfortable with but we're also kind of passionate about and find our way in the world with it. Um, it's definitely been my learning curve about, you know, don't be so stuck in your mindset, girl. Why, you know, open it up. <laughs> so do you like, how do you read the, the hand and fingerprints? Is it like um, all the lines and everything? You can say what well, they say? And um, for those who will be watching on the video, but by the way, those of you who aren't watching on the video and you're just listening to this recording, you can go to my page, my hands hyphen on hyphen business Facebook page where there's lots of videos where you can actually, you know, I give examples of your hands and I look at people's hands and I show them lines and I do stuff on flip charts and people love them, my live videos, etc. But for those of you who are watching, if I put my hand up against the camera, there are some lines like in my hand here, right? These are kind of what we call Palmer lines. They're kind of the lines that ch can change, often don't, but can change um, in your hand. But then also you either have, uh, have different types of lines, and I don't think that'll be very, you can see that on, on, a, on a, but it's like more fingerprintish, okay? You have those fingerprintish marks also on the palms of your hands as well. Um, and on the palms of your feet, but I don't go down, go down the feet route, I'm just doing the hand. And those two are separate because the lines that are actually the palmer lines on your hand, they can change. And they're like a representation of the neural pathways in your brain. So it's almost like you've created a way of thinking in, the, in, the, in your brain and it, your hands tend to reflect whatever's going on in your brain. And then your fingerprints form five months before you're born and they never change. So they are almost like, that's your soul's kind of, and if you look at them, they look like um, magnetic energy imprints. And the reason why I say that is, if you've ever done that, that um, uh, thing at school where you had the white paper or something, and then you had all the iron filings, and you put the magnet above it, and then it kind of suddenly just lined up in all these things, you go, oh my God, that's proof, there's something going on in between, but they're not touching. If you look at pictures of those patterns, they look very similar to a lot of fingerprints. And so there's the question, how do you end up with magnetic energy imprints at the end of your fingers, right? And, uh, well, I choose to believe that's your soul, you know, your soul's kind of influence on it. And, and they, there's, a, there's proof now, scientific proof that we actually do, do have sort of this magnetic energy around us. So, you know, I love the fingerprints because I feel like it's the one link between that kind of, it's like a physical proof of the magnetic energy that is around us. I feel like it's a, it's a real connection between the physical body and the spiritual self. And it, 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 it's proof sitting there in front of you that there is the spiritual or this magnetic energy, if you want to put it that way, that actually influences how your body develops. Because if they form five months before you're born, you know, at that time when your body is almost fully formed, um, and it's, I, almost, I choose to believe this, and I let, you know, I'm not saying that there's any proof in this, I just like stories, right? Um, but I choose to believe that at that point, the soul goes, okay, soul goes, okay, this is a, this is a, a, um, a viable body here. You know, let's, um, I'm going to have, I'm going to now influence how that body, um, develops or how the brain of that body develops. And so that it is designed to see things in a certain way. It's designed to struggle with things in, a, in, in another way, etc. And it's designed to be very good in that way because that's the canvas that I want to work within during this lifetime. I want to actually work with these challenges. I want to work with this perspective. You know, it's, it's why siblings can come from the same family and you can ask yourself, seriously, how do we come from the same family? We have the same parents. We, we kind of had such similar experiences. How, could, how is this possible? 
And I believe that it actually happens at that level. It's because of how we see life. You know, two people can see the same experience and you wonder if they were both, if the one was there. When you were there and you saw everything that happened and the other person tells you what happened, you go, seriously? It's like you were at a different party to the one I was at, you know? And, and I think that happens because of how we are designed to perceive life and experience life. And understanding how your brain is designed from your fingerprints can be very powerful for you in actually having better relationships with people, in how you communicate with other people and actually, and also in, in making better decisions for yourself because it's knowing what is right for me as opposed to, you know, should I do that? You know, I love, I, one of the things I talked to you about a little bit earlier is about how people are so, um, uh, this whole thing of having to follow all the gurus you know, let me do this and you must have a mentor and a mentor teaches you this and a mentor tells you you must do this and you must do that. And you can learn an enormous amount from that. But one of the things that a lot of us do is we give our power away to them and then we get annoyed with them when we don't get any success, right? And I think that a lot of that comes from the fact that you throw what is unique and different about you out the door to do whatever you're learning how to do and then you wonder why things don't work. Mm-hmm. And I think understanding who you are from your fingerprints, what motivates you, for me, that is like massive. Oh, my God, to actually know what I'm subconsciously motivated by, the thing that excites me, it's like, wow, this is so powerful. I don't have to go and do all of this, this um, uh, what is the word? You know, we go and do all this personal work and we dig and we delve and, well, what are my values? What really matters to me? And they seem to change because we don't quite get them right. Well, what if you're, you just look in your fingerprints and you go, oh, those are my primary values. I might have other ones underneath that that might change, but those are never going to change. I am pre-programmed to be motivated by these things. I mean, how powerful is that when you have to go and make a decision and you have to go and choose something and you go and an opportunity arises and you go, oh, I'm not going to get my things that I'm motivated by met by that opportunity. So therefore, I know that opportunity is not a great one for me, whereas if I go and do this, or if you do want to fulfill the opportunity, you can still do that. But you know that you have to go and find other ways to get those needs of your sub- subconscious needs of yours met so that you don't self-sabotage the opportunity. I mean, you know, as you can hear, I can definitely talk for weeks on end about <laughs> this. But, I mean, it's the kind of things that you can find out from your fingerprints. So, Helen, uh, between your family life and, you know, your husband, your kids, laughing together, walking, counting your steps, and reading people's hands, what would you say your typical day looks like? Ooh, that's an interesting one. Well, um, you know, the first thing is, is the priority is to get the kids to school. It depends whether it's holidays or not. We always sleep in a bit when it's holidays. Um, I tend to get, um, I tend to wake up before I have to get up and then I often lie in bed and I sit and actually all the things that I want to do that day, it's like I program them beforehand, you know, the day beforehand and all the answers and all the excitement and all the, everything that I feel like I want to focus on that day comes to me in the morning. And if I sleep, I sleep late and I have to get up straight away and I miss that window of all that inspiration and everything that comes to me that morning definitely affects my day. Um, and it doesn't feel, it doesn't quite flow as well. So I try generally to have that time for myself. It's a really, really important time for myself rather than getting up at a specific time. It's quite important to actually have those. Usually it's only like, I, I, it's like the inspiration comes as I'm waking up. And, you know, within 20 minutes, I'm kind of like, oh, I have to get up. I've got to go do that. I've got to go do this, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's that kind of feeling. Um, then, I, then I usually get up and I, and I either make a note or I'm so excited about it, I do remember. But, you know, it's take care of the kids, get their breakfast, get them off to school. Um, sometimes I take them to school. Sometimes my husband does. Um, and then we alternate in the afternoon. Whoever took them to school in the morning fetches them. Uh, then I um, typically, I like the mornings to be my creative time, my time when I sit and I get things done. Um, there are certain days of the week that I serve my clients, but the other days I keep completely to myself. So if, it, if it's a day when I'm serving clients, I just serve clients that day. I don't try to do anything else. It's just about the clients. It's just completely a client-focused day. But if it's a day where I'm not serving clients, then it's completely focused on me. Because to be honest with you, I'm not a great multitasker. I have to be one track minded and it needs to be me completely pouring myself out on behalf of my clients because what I've only begun to accept this recently, but what my clients tell me, I tell me I do is when I actually serve them, I'm effectively channeling. So I don't often remember what I've told them, but I record everything. So it's okay. Um, And, you know, I just, 
and that's why I think I get the kind of testimonials that I do from people about how powerful the work that they do with me is, is because it's quite, although the fingerprints lead into the, the you know, the work with them and, and inform the beginning of my discussion with them, it's almost like some other stuff comes through and threads get tied together in ways which are quite profound. And, and for me, that is very exciting and very, and I come away from those days very um, uh, kind of, you know, when something has been satisfied, like you've had the best meal or you've had the best sandwich or whatever it is, you know what I mean? And you kind of go, oh my God, that was amazing. And it kind of fills you up and makes your day. Mm -hmm. That's how it feels for me when I'm serving my clients and I'm allowing that flow to happen. Then um, other parts of my days when I'm, when I'm just working on my stuff, I find the mornings I aim at trying to create something, complete something, uh, fulfill some, you know, do some actual work to get a product done or to write blogs or, you know, do my emails or, you know, do my social, uh, the social media stuff I can get very stuck into. I'm at the moment focusing quite a lot on, on that. So I am putting a lot of energy into it, but I, uh, I generally try to do a set, a lot of the social media stuff up like for instance, my hands-on business page, try to set that up on a Monday once every two weeks and just have it all scheduled. And then I just add extra bits in during the week as I feel inspired. Um, you know, I feel an inspiration to share something. I, I, I share extras, but the, the, I like to have a certain structure that is actually taken care of. And then I add extra, extra bits in depending on how I'm inspired. The same with my emails. Um, and then uh, what else do I do? And usually I have lunch on my own or with my husband, depending on whether we feel like kind of having lunch together. We might go off somewhere together at one o'clock. Um, I always like those days. We're so nice and relaxed. I come back again. And usually I do, I often do free calls or I do connection calls or whatever the case may be after lunch until about three o'clock. Because I, for me, one of my highest values is connection. And I found that when I just, when I, when it came, became about, all about my business and just getting stuff done, I started to lose inspiration for it because what, the reason why I do what I do is to connect with people. And that is one of my highest values, as I know from my fingerprints, right? So I always try to schedule connection calls or, um, you know, interviews or whatever the case may be um, during that window until, you know, after lunch until about three o'clock. And except on the days when I'm not picking the kids up and then I go off to pick up my daughter and we have a wonderful conversation. I love the conversations on the way home about how her day was and what went on for her and, you know, real deep discussions about a lot of things. And she's so chatty and so engaged. And when I get home, then my son is home and we have a bit of a chat, etc. But, but of course, you know, he's my son, so he doesn't necessarily share very much. It's always like, how can I, how can I tell mom the smallest amount of information and make her go away? But then we have a bit of a giggle later on. And then it's family time, you know, um, after that, we kind of get together for dinner. Um, my husband is a wonderful cook, so I'm grateful for the fact that I do very, very little cooking. Um, and we just all sit and giggle and carry on and whatnot. I might do some gardening. I love gardening. I think it's one of the most peaceful ways to operate. And I can be very easily all in my head. And it's a really great way to get out of my head and just wind the day down water the garden, cut a few bits and pieces. It's not a massive garden because if I had, I knew I'd be there all day. So I made sure it was the little one when we bought the house. <laughs> so that's kind of like my day, but you know, it varies. I like, I like variety. I'm not very good on um, the same thing on a regular basis. I get bored and I start self-sabotaging. So I divide like my Mondays, I do this, my Tuesdays, I do that. You know, I, I make each of my days different so that I don't get bored. But I do also, you know, I do also think it's important to have certain things that you do do regularly. Otherwise, they're just nothing gets done. So Helen, throughout our entrepreneurial and business journey, we come across a lot of challenges. What would you say was your greatest challenge and how did you manage to overcome it? You know, I think the hardest thing, if I'm honest about it, and probably the thing I've become good at as a result um, is actually sort of asking for business. Um, I think, you know, if I'm thinking back to my previous businesses, especially about, you know, what, what was it? We can get very excited and thrilled about what it is that we do, but it's quite hard sometimes to go out and say, say to a person, you know, I have something to offer. Do you want it? <laughs> um, and I think it's, it's that thing of actually putting yourself out there. Um, I was quite shy. I mean, I told you I got into business, you know, it was not intentional at all. It was, it was accidental. I was just a bit bored. I needed something to do and I couldn't go back into corporate work because I'd been ill and whatnot. And it was just meant to be a temporary thing. But I think I was so desperate to kind of like meet up with people or have something to do that I was willing to kind of go out there and say, 
oh, you know, I hear you need X, Y, or Z. Do you think that you might be willing to give me a go and let me try it out? And it was a really good, you know, it forced me to get over a certain level of shyness to become quite confident about going out there, about discovering also about the fact that, you know, I did actually have something valuable to offer because half the time you don't know if you do really, to be honest with you, until you actually start putting them out. When I started doing the fingerprint analysis, I had learned from my previous businesses with that. So, but I was a bit nervous, you know, previous businesses were kind of fairly traditional. So it was kind of easy to kind of, you know, talk to people in a sensible way and have them agree to do business with me. But <clears throat> fingerprint analysis, I was like, how am I going to do this one? Is this going to work or isn't it? I mean, I had knew nothing about what I call, you know, the coaching come spiritual come that type of industry at all. I knew nothing about, about how that worked. And I didn't know how, how many people might be actually interested in it. So I initially kind of went to people that I was comfortable with and said, you know, can I do your fingerprints? Would you be interested? And I did them for free. And I initially just to kind of see if people, you know, got something valuable from it. And I think that was for me the challenge is for us to sometimes understand what is the value of what we offer to other people. Because we might have a lot of value and we might think it's fantastic like I do with the fingerprint analysis, right? I can talk about it for hours on end. But, you know, is it valuable to other people? And I mean, I have to be honest, I'm, I'm constantly surprised by how valuable people find it. I mean, I know I do, but it's like I never expect other people to find it as valuable as I do, because it's something new and it's unique. It's not like it's, you know, it's fine. We all need to buy toilet paper. We know everybody needs to buy toilet paper. So if you're in business to sell toilet paper, it's not really that hard, right? You kind of, you know, it's just based on a price thing and a comfort thing. Can I, you know, what can I do? But if you're selling fingerprint analysis or, or not, but you're not actually selling fingerprint analysis, but that's the, the tool that I'm using. I'm actually selling, you know, find your life purpose and be happy in many ways and, and find a business that really excites you and fulfills it you and you really enjoy enjoy you know, running. Um, but it's, it's that process of learning what is it that people value about it, is it what, about what you are excited about. And for me, that, that really has been a huge challenge. Um, but, a, but, a, but one I've really embraced. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm a, I, I always talk about um, uh, people always so seek confidence and they always kind of say, I want to be more confident. I want to be more confident. I'll be successful when I'm confident, right? You can't be, it, it, confidence doesn't come first. Courage is what you need. It's after you take action and you actually try something and you do something is when you get the confidence. But the more you do something, the more confidence you get, the easier it is to do each thing. So people often think they need the confidence first. But for me, it's always courage. And I find that the, the biggest leaps require courage, not confidence. Um, you know, and, and I think that for me has been, was originally the big challenge was kind of getting out there and actually being seen and saying, this is, this is what I have to offer. And I really think it can be of value to you and actually kind of having people feedback to me, yes or no. And being, I think that the, the, how I overcame it was to, in many ways, when people were, didn't love what I had to offer was to actually ask questions, ask a lot of questions about how does this help you? You know, I always question people. People sometimes wonder, you know, what planet is she on? She's asking me so much questions. I'm really interested in how people think, what they find valuable, what they don't find valuable. And then adjust, adjust what I'm doing accordingly and say, okay, people are finding this is really, really good. So I'm going to actually shift what I'm doing to offer this much more. So for instance, when I first started with the fingerprint analysis, I didn't bring the business stuff in. I mean, I've been running my own businesses very successfully 17 years. I didn't actually mention business at all. Um, but I, so many of my clients, we would, we would be, be talking about stuff, the life purpose stuff, and then they kind of start mentioning their businesses. And I go, oh, yeah, you should do this and this and this and this. And, and, and they go, what? You know about that kind of stuff? I said, yeah, I've been running my own business for 17 years. I know how that all operates. They go, why don't you share the stuff? Why don't you be teaching the stuff? I'm going, oh, plenty of people out there teaching business. What do I need to, be, to teach business to for? And they're like, yeah, but nobody's teaching it from the perspective you're teaching it from. So then, you know, I had to learn to shift what I was doing and realize people actually wanted to bring their life purposes into their businesses and express it through their businesses. And so I really believe that ultimately in business, our biggest challenges are often the source of our greatest income. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? Yeah, <laughs> that, that, was, that was a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> So Helen, as, as we come across challenges, we also, yeah. the, the longer you run your business, the more successes you get. So what would you say was your greatest success? Well, it, dep it depends what you define success as. You know, for a lot of people, some people it's money 
And definitely I've been down the road of actually making a heck of a lot of money, even with, with all my various businesses and including in this business. Um, but one of the challenges sometimes happens is that you can, um, so this is a challenge I didn't talk about, which I think is, is a relevant one for a lot of people starting out in their business, is that sometimes you can be too successful. And what ends up happening is you become too exhausted and tired, and therefore you don't want any business anymore. But you've, And that's why you start self-sabotaging all your offers, is because you're actually too tired and you're scared of actually getting more work, and so you don't actually want to get out there, uh, which I thought is kind of an interesting thing that happened to me where, you know, a few years back that I was so successful in what I was doing. It's like, oh, there's no time for me because I didn't have good boundaries around what I was doing and, and, and saying no to certain people, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very, very important to have some self-protection in place and actually perhaps rather build your success rather than be crazy successful. Um, in, and by that, I mean financially. But I think for me, I'm just trying to think, you know, what are, what are, what are my criteria for success? Um, I think one is, having family time. When I, uh, so I feel very successful right now to be able to earn a, earn a good living and have plenty of time with my family. That feels very successful. I don't earn the same level that I used to earn in my previous businesses, but that's a choice, okay? Um, because in my previous businesses, I had two small children who I never saw. I had a nanny. I worked six days a week. I was constantly irritable, and I just don't, I, I didn't want that this time around. And you know what? Yes, so I'm lucky enough to have had a cushion that I could actually then start this business with and slowly build it up into a place where I'm earning good money that I'm really happy about. Um, but my family's my priority. So for me, that feels more successful than having earned so much money in my previous business. Does that make sense to you? Of course. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, people have different things. It's what matters to them, right? Yeah. Um, and that's my, my priority is definitely quality of life and family time. Amazing. Uh, so Helen, uh, we always come, uh, you know, as entrepreneurs, we, we, within the business, we have to come up with a lot of great ideas. So yeah. where would you say do you come up with your best ideas? Um, those moments in bed, you know what I mean? Like before I get up in the morning. I mean, I, um, I often will, I never see anything as a problem. A lot of people I, that I speak to, I'm astounded by how they often will, We'll talk about things as a block or a problem. I always just think um, a block or a problem is just simply something that hasn't been solved yet. It's not something that will never be solved. It's not a permanent problem. So I think my, my greatest ideas are usually solutions to something that I'm, that, that I'm experiencing a challenge with or something like that. And they always come to me, I would say, I won't say the actual full solution comes in the morning. You know what I mean? At the, at, like when I wake up. But I think the, the preparation for that solution often happens through conversation with other people. Um, I get enormous amount of input because I told you that I like to listen to people. I like to hear what they have to say. I'm really genuinely interested. And I hear all the stuff that they give me and I put it all in a pot and it goes in here and, and I put it out to the universe and I go, okay, this is real good stuff. How am I going to bring this all back into my, into my world and, and do what I'm, you know, my thing? And I wake up in the morning with all my solutions sorted <laughs> and put into place, not necessarily the next day, but I'm, I trust as to it, everything happens in the right time. Hmm. I am fairly go with the flow kind of girl. <laughs> awesome. Um, also, yeah. Helen, uh, throughout our journey, uh, we obviously come across a lot of uh, inspiration and inspiration says people who inspire yeah. us. Uh, do you have yeah. any so-called personal heroes? Well, actually, you know, people have asked me these questions before, and I don't often think of the traditional <laughs> answers. I mean, yes, uh, Nelson Mandela, having come from Southern Africa and ha having, you know, growing up while he was in jail, and, and I, I was went to school in apartheid South Africa and stuff like that. So, and then how he came out and he, I think for me, um, he is amazing. And, and what I really respect about him is, is something what, that not a lot of people may know about, but it's what they call the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, which they put together, where it was all about really forgiving the past and moving on. So they would have these, these, these meetings where people would actually tell the truth about what had happened in the past so that other people could put it, put it to bed, you know, putting aside atrocities and saying, you know, we're going to let these atrocities go in order for the future. And that ability, I mean, that is, 
that is such advanced thinking that that whole concept that we don't have that we don't need to blame let's let go of blame let's work on forgiveness i mean for me that is wow 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 especially with what he'd, he'd actually gone through in his life and sure he made some mistakes i think all human beings do to some extent but it was really much more uh, for me my real respect is about the spirit of the man and 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 how um and I think we should all be like that. I think we should just let go because I think it's so much more powerful uh, when we don't have an attachment to having having somebody, you know, having having to put somebody in their place because they've done something wrong or having to punish somebody for something, but just kind of, kind of say, you know what, let's just move on, let's do the next thing and not take all this extra baggage with us. So he's one of my, uh, I would say, a more famous hero. I also happen to love the Dalai Lama because... I love how much he laughs and I like to laugh too. <laughs> so, um, you know, in between everything else and all the what profound things he's saying and he's talking about, he just likes, he lives a very simple life where there's a lot of laughter and joy and that, that really appeals to me. But I think, you know, my greatest heroes are often people that nobody would know about that I have met, who I see their lives and I see that the challenges that they go through. I mean, one woman in particular comes to mind. I mean, you know, a single mother, three kids, really a struggle the whole time, but her ability to get back up and just consistently go and try for the next thing, just get back up and say, I'm going to do this again. Okay, I didn't get it right that time. It was a failure. I only got three people turn up, but you know what? I don't care. She didn't, nothing holding her down, nothing. I mean, just this constant, you know, resilience. And for me, it's the things in these, these examples in everyday lives is what really and truly inspires me. I meet people all the time where they will tell me a story and I'll think, wow, that's so incredible. That's so amazing. And they'll go, but it's my, they don't think it's a big deal, you know, and I'm going, but from another person's perspective, can you not see how incredible this is? You know, she says, that's just what I do. The, the example that I've just given you. And I go, yeah, but, not everybody does that. Most people actually put their, their tools down and say, oh, I can't cope. Thank you very much. And it's, you just keep getting back up and you, you need to value that within yourself, you know. And so for me, it's, it's, it's those stories that people tell me that, and I like the fact that I get them all the time, you know. <laughs> I'm also very inspired by, there are some, you know, people who write spiritual books, which kind of just, um, we all have these moments, including me, but, you know, but my moments are short because I know what to do to kind of get out of them. But those moments when you kind of go into, a do, you know, a down cycle where you're kind of feeling a bit, oh, you know, I don't know whether I want to do this. What am I doing with my life? You know, who am I, et cetera. And it's, I find it quite helpful sometimes to get one of my spiritual books out. Or, and I call it spiritual, but really it's just a way of thinking kind of book, a book that is an inspirational in some way. Usually it tells a story. Uh, recently, you know, I gave my mother um, a book, which I like a lot, called Proof of Heaven. I don't know if you know it by Eben Alexander, but, you know, she loved that because it was a, you know, a, neuros a, 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 a neuro neurosurgeon who had died and his whole brain had died as well. So nobody could say this near-death experience was actually, you know, synapses doing their thing in their brain. And then he came back and told his story and how he came back to life, etc. And, you know, my father just died and, and, and my mother's getting really old now and, you know, people worry about death. And even if they have a belief and they have faith and everything else around it, sometimes they just need a little bit of like, yeah, okay, my faith is good. Something to support their faith. And, you know, books like that, you can pick up, you can read them again and you can feel, oh, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> it's okay, you know. Um, I just, they, they, there's so many, I don't even know how many others to pick. I love also, I, I love also books by uh, people like Seth Godin and Malcolm Gladwell, you know, the trendsetters, because they get my brain going, Ooh. I love that whole feeling that really always inspires me about all the, the wonderful uh, research they've done and how that brings, you know, brings it back in. And did you read, I don't know if you read my recently, I read uh, Seth Godin's written a tiny little book that he calls like a manifesto versus a book because it's so small called We Are All Weird. And I mean, actually, the funny thing is, I've always been teaching my daughter from the youngest age that she should be comfortable with being weird and being a bit different, because that's actually quite special and quite unique. And I loved how he talked about the fact that we are actually all now getting opportunities to be different, to have things uniquely our way. And there's a huge market and things are changing. I don't want to go into that now, but I've got a little video on it. 
um, on my hands-on business um, Facebook page where I actually mention about you know the weirdness etc and, and weird is one of my favorite words because I like to do weird stuff like fingerprint analysis you know <laughs> uh, and my children it's good to be weird and it's okay to be different because it, it makes you stand out and makes you unique and it often you know leader, leaders before they kind of their stuff becomes normal they're considered a bit weird and uh, this is the way of the future as far as I'm concerned we are all weird we're all unique and we're different so that's another book recently that's kind of inspired me enormously. So Helen, as we already touched on a couple of books uh, with you, uh, a lot of people I come across say that at some point in life, they came across a book that changed their life. Did you have such a book? And if you did, what was it? Probably not, because I've just had consistently had ones. I've had, I'm just trying to think, um, not one specific book. Uh, I think I've met people, you know, along the way who've been little. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking as, as I'm going along. I don't think one in particular, because I've got so many. <laughs> I've got so many, you know, and they're just one after the other um, that I read, like series. I love the Brian. Uh, Brian Weiss, I think I really quite have liked. I think it, he, he was in the early days of me getting comfortable about whether, you know, we were spiritual beings or not. I mean, I've known we always were because I was always a slightly weird child with strange and unusual abilities from a very young age. I mean, my nanny uh, for the first five years of my life was a, a, was a Swazi uh, Sangoma, which is the equivalent of a witch doctor. My mother only found out afterwards, but she swears that's why um, I think a little differently. So, I mean, I had some unusual experiences as a, as a young child, but at the same time, modern life makes you question, you know, the afterlife, um, whether we're actually spiritual beings, whether it's actually dust to dust, all that kind of stuff. And I think I absolutely loved Brian Weiss's books when I first came across them because he made me feel it was okay to believe in us living more than one life, which had always felt absolutely right for me. But growing up in a Christian household, that wasn't kind of considered okay. You know, we lived the one life and then we died and we went to heaven because that's what Jesus did for us. And, and yet for me, I had this truth within myself that this was just, this was just one part of my journey. It wasn't the only, only part of my journey and it just didn't feel right. And then I read this, these, uh, the, his first book, which is many um, masters, many lives where he regret, he's a, a um, a, psych a psychiatrist, also very linear, didn't believe any of that stuff, and by accident, um, you know, regresses this one girl who is not very bright, uh, and yet in, in the regression, she's clearly on a, a different level of intelligence, right? Um, and she suddenly sp starts speaking different languages, unique, I mean, for him, he blew, blew his mind, and, and I think, although the books, none of these books written by these doctors are particularly well written, because they're not, these, they are doctors, they are not writers, right? The, the truth of their stories I think can give you enormous comfort in supporting sometimes a belief that you might hold but nobody else agrees with and then you find somebody who kind of says actually I have proof that your belief is accurate and so I think I think I must have read his stuff in my early 20s or something like that and, and you know just those kind of books that support one's own sense of knowing those are the books that kind of I love and that was probably one of the first ones that I read awesome. along those lines. <laughs> Not business related at all. <laughs> business oh. was just like a business for me is, is a, um, it's like a, a default, something I do automatically. You know how there's some things people have to learn and the other things that you just kind of do because it seems normal. Mm -hmm. um, and my interest level is always on the spiritual side, the, the, the business has always been like, well, that's what you do. What do you mean? Of course you go and make offers. Of course you go and, you know, earn money from it. And of course it's okay to earn money. And, you know, I don't ever understand why people get blocked when it comes to business. Uh, so Helen, you've been in business for a very long time and, uh, you know, th throughout the years, you, you gained a lot of experience, knowledge, and wisdom. So out of your experience, knowledge, and wisdom, would you share with us your top three tips and strategies uh, in business for any entrepreneur and business owner who is listening to us today to drive the business and life forward? Well, it depends which avenue you're coming from. I mean, there is definitely like, do I want to just earn money? What's my priority is to earn money. There's different set of rules, which I think a lot of people teach anyway. But I think 
Um, the most important for me, uh, because what I teach is really how to be happy and earn, earn good money. I believe that ultimately, if you, the first thing that I would say, the first tip is you have to be yourself. You have to be your unique self, not the version that your parents told you should be, not the one that the, the, that you know um, that you've been conditioned to be through schooling or whatever the case may be, not that version, but that weird, slightly different, slightly unique person that is within you. That is, I, I think you have to be that first because if you aren't that, how are you different? How are you unique? What do you bring to the table that's different and unique? And how can you stand out? Because the truth is, we live in a very crowded marketplace. And I don't just mean a crowded marketplace, but I mean one where, oh my God, the amount of information that is being thrown at us constantly. How can people know about you? If you, you know, you have to embrace whatever aspect of you is unique and different and almost like amp it up a bit. So like if you're quite shy and quite mousy, then maybe you want to just be, you want to almost emphasize that part of you. Do you know what I mean? Whereas if you are kind of big and brash like me, maybe you want to just stick your face very close. Whatever it is, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you see the point that I'm trying to make is like, you have to almost like amp up what is unique and different about you in order for you to stand out. I think you also need to be willing to take risks um, with who you are. And I don't necessarily mean with a lot of money or whatever it is, but it's almost like take a risk in who I show up as, who, how I show up and who I am, because how else do you stand out? Um, and for me, I mean, even in my previous businesses, the reason why I did so well was I stood out from my competition, you know? Um, but I think that there's another aspect that made me stand out. And I think this is a very important aspect is that people need to re recognize success is not possible alone. It's all about your relationships. And so after standing out and doing your thing, it needs to be about the relationships you're developing with people. It needs to be about understanding, you know what? Don't throw your stuff at people. Ask people, invite people, invite people to, to into conversation with you, at which point, you know, if your stuff is appropriate, you can offer it to them or talk to them about it. I'm talking about the one-to-one -one stuff here. Um, but even, you know, even if you've got a team of people underneath you, they need to have the same ethos as you do, that same warmth. People want warmth. They are desperate for warmth. They don't want to be a cog in the wheel anymore. They've lost interest in that. I mean, if, what are we all buying? Think about it. We, we would rather spend a little bit more money on a particular product if that product is designed to be exactly us, unique to us, you know? I remember when going and buying push chairs, right? I mean, I'm quite a sensible woman. My parents come, are, are, you know, accountants and teachers and whatnot, very sensible, pragmatic people. So why would you go and buy a fancy bugaboo, very expensive push chair for your, your, your kid? Well, I have a bit of personality, right? So I was willing to spend a bit of extra money because I could have that covered in fabric that made mine unique and different, which meant I could always find it whenever I was lo out looking. And I felt good when I was walking behind it. I think that's how people operate now. They want something that is, that is unique and different that, that um, they can actually apply, that applies specifically to them. And I think that's why, why they love coming to me because they don't get a cookie cutter Thing when they work with me do you know what I mean they get their fingerprints are unique to them mm. and their story and what I share with them is completely and utterly unique to them I don't have a system that I put you through that everybody goes through because I believe everybody's different and, and you need a, a unique approach to you um, and so it's very important I think whatever you're doing in your business I look if you're selling you know some tax it's a whole different ball game and you, it has to be about the numbers and it's not about what I'm talking about at all other than perhaps how you approach your business and how you feel in your business. Um, but still, ultimately, if I'm thinking about thumbtacks, I went searching for thumbtacks uh, yesterday and, you know, there were three different types for, for me to buy and I bought the more expensive ones because they were more what suited me. So even at that level, you know, how can you make what you're doing different and unique and special? So, um, so I gave you two there, right? Okay, relationships, be yourself and relationships for me, the two most important things, I think. The third one is, I mean, it's an obvious one, but it's, it's just because I see such, people just don't do this. We are so busy navel gazing uh, and thinking about how perfect we are, etc. We're just not making any offers. We're not saying, this is what I have to offer. Would you like to buy it? You know, and I don't mean shove it in people's faces and go and just because we love to put everything up on social media. We almost like put our posters up there, et cetera, et cetera. But have conversations with people and ask them, 
you know, is this something that you would find useful? Talk to people, get some feedback on what you're offering, make some shifts to your offers, but actually make offers first, you know, I have this to offer, I want to do this, is it something you'd be interested in? You get a yes or a no, if it's a no, no I say, why not? You know, how could I make it so that it would be more exciting to you? Can you help me? People love to help. But the key thing is, I would say, make offers. Because you ain't going to make any money unless you tell somebody you've got something to offer. You offer them something and say, would you like to buy this? And you can't, it's like a car, a move, what do they say about a moving car, right? You can turn a moving car. In other words, if you have an offer and you make an offer and you get a no, you can adjust it. But if you're not making any offers at all, how can you know whether to make any adjustments to it or not? You can just go, oh, nobody's buying my stuff. Well, that's because you haven't told them what you've got to offer yet. Do you see what I mean? Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that with us, Helen. Um, that was brilliant. Um, also, throughout your business journey, did you come across any kind of resources that made your life easier? The internet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I started in business, the internet wasn't really much of a thing, you know? It was, I mean, we did all our businesses done okay i i remember having my first laptop was this really it wasn't connected to the internet it was just so i could type up what i needed to type up and print it out and give people hard copies of stuff um but for me the biggest change in the time that i've been doing business is actually that you have a computer you don't have to do things you could email everybody everything i mean and you can get all the information you need on your computer I mean, anything, doesn't matter what it is. If you don't know how to do something, go to YouTube. There's a video so it will tell you how to do it. We sit here and we think, okay, I don't know how to, I don't know, um, uh, maybe I want to run a tele summit, say, right? But actually, I don't know how to do that. I'm sure somebody's got a, got a YouTube video on it to at least give you the first few steps. And then you can search on the second steps once you know it and find YouTube is probably my biggest resource. <laughs> and guess who taught me that? My kids. <laughs> because that's where the young kids are all going now if they want to figure out how to do something they go to youtube my daughter was telling me how to do my nails the other day she's 11 i said where did you find this stuff youtube mom can i get a youtube um as thing so that because there's a bunch of channels i want to subscribe to because there's some really great stuff going on there you know i mean something i i, I couldn't figure out how to how to change the strap on my watch i put like a, a bit bit touch it i went to youtube they told me how to change it. You know, there's a video that explains, okay, it sounds ridiculous. I mean, I can't believe that I'm actually even saying this as my biggest resource, but I'm suddenly realizing, oh, oh my God, this is probably what I use more than anything else. <laughs> because, you know, I, I remember my dad always saying to me about, um, I, I said to him, you know, you had four kids. What do you think is important about parenting and about what do you teach kids, etc.?" And he said, you know what? The information doesn't matter. What you really need to teach them is how to find the information they need to do whatever it is they want to do. And so that's why I'm probably passionate about YouTube because I think that it will give you whatever you need. You don't need to go and find a resource somewhere else that, that'll, we all need different things at different times. Mm. And we all need to know how, to, I mean, even to the point of view of like, oh my God, how to prune. Oh, oh, that's right. I moved a, I have a star jasmine, in my, which is kind of like a plant, right? And I moved it and the thing started to die and I started freaking out because it was such a pretty plant, right? I went to YouTube to find out what the problem was with my plant. I mean, so you can find your resource for everything from your business all the way through to everything in your personal life on YouTube. And if, and I think it's so big now that I, I can't imagine that every question hasn't been answered, but if it hasn't, you could put something out there. Somebody will create something for you. So I'm, I'm really, I've never ever told anybody that YouTube was my greatest resource before. And I'm actually, part of me is a little embarrassed by it, but actually I, I just suddenly realized that I think it is the greatest. It's the place to find the information you need, whatever you need for whatever work you want to do. So therefore there is no reason to stop yourself anymore saying, I don't know how to do that or I can't do that because I'm, you know, how would I do it? I can't imagine how I would do it. Just search for it on, on, on YouTube. You'll find the answer. And then you'll think, oh, why have I been sitting on my butt for the last six months doing nothing, thinking I didn't know how to, I don't know, um, set up my MailChimp account or, you know, or set up my, um, 
um, Facebook uh, business page or whatever the case may be. If you don't know how to do any of that stuff, just go to YouTube, type it in, and somebody will tell you how. Thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs> <laughs> you never expected that one. I did not expect that one to come out of my mouth either. <laughs> So Helen, you've been in a business for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had your successes, you know, you, you, you're very happy in your family life. You adjusted your work life to, you know, to match your family life. You know, you, you, you have a good life. <laughs> I do. I do. I have a really good life. I'm really very happy. And I feel very lucky. I feel very, very blessed. I want to make that clear because I think a lot of us don't, value how good things are i feel really really blessed about the life that i have today i have created it but i still feel blessed so um you know you you got basically everything you need you've been really successful you've had the money you know you have the family you got everything but what is your next big goal dream aim and if there is somebody listening today who could potentially help you get there, who would it be? Mm -hmm. Gosh. Um, because I'm very intuitively led, I don't usually have like a massive big goal. I kind of get these hits and I kind of go for them. Um, what I'm doing at the moment is, you know, actually, all right, let's talk about something that doesn't have anything to do with my business, which I'm quite passionate about. As a result, I'm not putting a lot of energy into it at the moment, but actually, if somebody's open to kind of doing this, I really believe that every child in this, uh, the age of, right about the age of, I don't know, 12, maybe 14, if at the worst 15, um, should have their fingerprints done. And people should get a real clarity around what is actually um, motivates them, what excites them, where their gifts are, so they can stop trying to turn these kids into, you know, square pegs that are trying to fit them into round holes, get a real clarity for these kids so that they stop feeling small about who they are and feel comfortable with who they are. So if somebody's passionate about helping kids and getting kids on the right path and wants to talk to me about a collaboration, about how we can get, you know, fingerprint analysis into schools to help kids, it's not my business, but I would absolutely, because, because I've seen what's gone on with my kids myself, be up for really helping somebody to actually bring it to the into all the schools and help these kids make a big difference in their lives amazing thank you so helen we're coming to the end of the show okay. uh you know we had a really good time it's been a lot of fun and thank you for sharing everything but before we say our goodbyes is there anything else you would like to share with us today or advise on well, I think it probably the theme, you know, the theme, I'm really, you know, my thing is that I believe we are spiritual beings who come to this earth to have a uh, human experience to grow um, ourselves. I think that there's two, two sides to us. I think there's the, the side to us, which is the human being, like, how can I survive in this world? It's almost like a, a um, subconscious you know, a survival instinct, which is, you know, how do I avoid rejection and all those kind of typical things. But then you also have another part of you, which is all really about your spiritual survival and how do I grow spiritually. And I would really like you, whoever's listening, to really embrace that part of you and to recognize that part of you, that you are actually a spiritual being having a human experience and that both are equally important and that actually you came to this earth to to do some work on yourself, share your gifts, do some work on yourself and grow um, on a spiritual and a, and, a, and a human level. Nobody says you have to go and bow at the temple every five minutes. Everybody has a different path. It's not about that. It's not about becoming somebody who's, who's devout in any way. If that's your choice, you, you do that. We all here to do things our own way, but the point is to actually embrace that and to honor the inner commitment. You know deep down inside you, you have an inner knowing inside you that is talking to you all the time and saying to you, what is your purpose? What are you here to do? And, and you know, I mean, I've known since I was a child that I'm here to, to help people basically ensure that people meet or fulfill their heavenly commitments, right? That, that has been inside me for a long time, but I have just hidden it and just buried it and said, I'm 
<laughs> what a ridiculous idea. Um, you have some nice, wonderful, ridiculous ideas in you too that need, you need to bring out and go, what if this was true? What if actually this is, how could I integrate this into my life as it is at the moment and make small shifts in my life to help me make this thing come true? And that's what I think my big message for you would be because I think that, you know, my father died um, just before he turned 95. And he'd been a good man in his life, not particularly ambitious, but although, you know, one would say not particularly ambitious, but in actual fact, he left the UK and he went to Africa when you still had to take a ship to get there. You know, he lived in, 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 in the bush in the dark and he brought up three kids and he was very brave and, in, in, sorry, four kids and in, very brave in everything that he did. And he came back to the UK age 82. He's never been a man full of regrets or whatever, but those last few years, he, he did have some regrets about not having fulfilled his potential. I don't want to feel like that. And I don't want you to feel like that. I don't want you to look back on your life when you get towards the end of your life and go, I had all this potential and what did I do with it? And his self-worth started to go down. I don't want us to feel that way. I want us to feel like, wow, I tried. I made an effort and I did something. You don't have to change the world. Sometimes part of your purpose is like me. In, there's a part of me that it, it's about how can I be happy and it's about creating that happiness. And I've discovered that, you know, my family make me happy. But we have seasons that we live, you know, and, and the season at the moment is my family are here and this is what I need to focus on right now. They'll leave home. And it'll just be me and my husband. Then I'll have a different focus as to what will make me happy. But ultimately, nobody's here to suffer. So what do you need to do to stop suffering and to fulfill your purpose and to feel happy? Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Helen, for anybody who would like to get in touch with you or follow you in any way, what's the best way to do it? Well, I'm very passionate right at this moment. I'm very passionate about what I'm doing on social media with my Hands on Business um, Facebook page, which is hands-on-business, the Facebook page, which I'm, I'm sharing a lot of videos and a lot of resources and the blogs, everything else on there. I also have a website, which is hands-on-business.com, where you can find out a bit more. You can sign up to my mailing list um, as well. I'd love you to join me. Um, otherwise, just, you know, Find me on Facebook under Helen Elizabeth Evans and message me and I'm willing to have a chat. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much for coming on the show. It's been a great fun. Uh, you know, it's, it's been really insightful. <laughs> so thanks for making the time. And I really look forward to meeting you again in London. Fantastic. That'd be brilliant. Thanks, Fedlan. I really appreciate that. I really, really feel um, very uh, honored that you got me on for these interviews. Thank you very much.